Good morning. Uh, my name is Courtney Spousta. I'm Curator of Education at Wichita Art Museum. Um, thank you for joining us for our virtual Senior Wednesday this October 2020. Uh, I am so pleased to uh, welcome artist Hugo Zolada Romero. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to give a brief bio intro of him. And we're so glad that you joined us virtually. Uh, we hope in the future that we can return to our normal Senior Wednesdays where we get to welcome you with bagels and coffee at 10 a.m. We get to see your wonderful faces. Our program normally begins. So again, thank you for joining us. It's wonderful to have you here today. Um, I have invited Hugo to speak with us this morning. Hugo is an amazing artist. He's also a colleague. He works here at the Wichita Art Museum as part of our wonderful security team. He has been part of WAM for, we were trying to remember, five or six years. So he is a valuable uh, team member and many of you probably know him and have seen him in the galleries. He knows more about our collections than many of us do because he gets to look at them a lot. Um, Hugo received a BFA in studio arts with the emphasis in photo media this past summer from Wichita State University. He is an interdisciplinary artist of Guatemalan heritage and a current Harvester Arts Community Fellow. His experience as a first generation immigrant informed his artistic world view. Hugo is interested in the way in which images function as an expression of belief. This morning, he is going to talk with us about a wonderful project he's been working on called Camera for the Commons. This is a special project, um, Camera for the Commons, or C4C. Did I get that right? C4C, a collaborative public art project supported by Harvester Arts and the Knight Foundation Fund. This gives the community agency in creating room scale camera obscuras in multiple Wichita neighborhoods. Um, he has been working on this for a year, and a part of his project is reaching new community audiences um, and people to learn more about the camera obscura. Um, we are so excited to have him here with us this morning, so please help me in welcoming Hugo to our virtual presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney Spalsa, for having me here in the Wichita Art Museum for um, hosting this talk. I'm excited to tell you about Camera for the Commons and what exactly it is and when it'll be implemented and how soon you'll be able to visit one. So let's start with the presentation. Okay, Camera for the Commons is a Harvester Arts Community Fellowship Initiative. So Harvester Arts has had a, a community fellow initiative for the past uh, four years or so, and this is the first year where they're actually seeking artists that are making work that is socially engaged or falls into the category of social practice as an art form. So part of that is uh, training, financial support, and um, mentoring for the execution of these different projects. So myself, Sarah Miose, and Paris Cunningham are the three Harvester Arts artists this year. Um, we all have different projects that engage the community in some way. So Paris Cunningham is making a project where she's taking Wichita stories and making a podcast out of them and learning basically why people are drawn to Wichita or why they come back after possibly moving to college or um, after finishing a career elsewhere. And Sarah Meose is working on a project called Be Seen. You'll probably see it on social media right now. And that project is geared towards the Asian American community in Wichita and trying to increase voter turnout and participation amongst that community. So, all right, so I'll start a little bit about my own work. Um, I think that's important to sort of put this into context of how I got to making Camera for the Commons or why this idea of place and site interests me. So this is uh, an image from 
a work I made in undergrad just uh, during the spring, actually. And this was taken from a family photo. The image in the middle is a place called the Catedral de Esquipulas. Um, it is a very important pilgrimage site. It's been around for about three centuries and it continues to be a, a site that is documented constantly. So the picture is actually from my family archive and I removed my family from them and then presented them again below in cyanotype sort of to create this difference between the existence of a site and the permanence of it and then sort of the impermanence of family and people in our lives. Um, so this speaks to my interest in place and the community that lives there and also the history of photography and sort of this idea of uh, places being photographed constantly and how the meaning behind what these places are uh, change and how people interact with them. This next image is a response to the project by Horizontes. So Horizontes happened in 2017. It was um, a Night City's challenge winner. Um, so they were able to make several murals in Wichita. So if you go to the north end of Wichita, you'll see them all up and down Market Street. And this is actually on Market and 21st Street. The image is of the Nomar Theater, which was a pretty like happening place. It was an important place in the cultural um, heritage of Wichita. It was um, a place where there were a lot of movies and concerts and so on. At some point, um, that place shut down, but the building still exists. So it's a building that I find interesting as an icon, and uh, it's something that I wanted to highlight in my response to this project. So the image is actually made with a pinhole camera, and I'll be talking about that soon. Um, it was actually made with an ammunition box, and I put two slides of sheet film inside of it, and then uh, exposed it and what I did was I flipped those around to speak about the divide that exists currently in that area so um, and this is from the website of Horizontis which I'll read to you um, very quickly Let's see so the Horizontis project was a socially engaged community art project that aimed to connect two underrepresented neighborhoods in North Wichita the predominantly Latin uh, American North End and historically African American Northeast neighborhoods, which are both physically and psychologically separated by a large grain elevator along the industrial corridor. So this image, I wanted to physically divide the building in half by switching those places and then printing it. And it's another way of speaking about my interest in place and site. And um, and because of the, the format being an old uh, photography technique, also speaks to this idea of memory and just history. So we'll start to the next one, okay. So I'm gonna give you a short little art history lesson about the camera obscura and the science of optics, which is something I find um, extremely fascinating and something that I was really drawn to in my undergrad of being interested in how to make different cameras, how they work. And then there are different applications in communicating truth or documenting historical events. So this is a, a very sort of intriguing shape and you can see a person going inside of it and we'll talk more about how this works and why it's out there. So a camera obscura literally means a dark chamber. A camera obscura is a device with a small hole on one side that allows light in which projects an image onto the other side. Because the concept is elegant and it's simple, this allows for a number of different shapes or sizes for a dark chamber. So it doesn't always need to be in the shape of a box. So the discovery of the behavior of light dates back to antiquity, with several cultures discovering that light moves in a straight line while observing that light passing through a small hole or aperture created an image that is upside down and, and in reverse. So the earliest known record of a camera obscura can be found in the writings of a Chinese philosopher named Mosey in the fourth century BCE. And in that same century, Aristotle also noticed that light from a sun eclipse that passes through the holes between the leaves projects an image of an eclipsed sun on the ground. So I found this really uh, sort of intriguing image of just a shed, um, but this is during a solar eclipse and this is light passing through those leaves and creating these little crescent shapes. So 
also, um, another person that discovered how light works is Al Kindi. He was an Arab philosopher, a mathematician, and a physician, and a musician. And he also performed experiments with light and using a pinhole camera in the ninth century and proved again the behavior of light. And in this other image, you'll see a basically a box with a hole in it, and you'll see that the diagram of how exactly that light works. So because light goes into a straight line, it's basically taking little rays are reflecting from each point and then being shown on the other side. So if the hole is a bit bigger, you won't see anything except for a blur, but once it's smaller, it sort of acts like a funnel for light. So this brings us to a very interesting figure in the history of science. His name is Al Hazan. Um, and he wrote a book called um, The Book of Optics, and it's a seven volume tome um, about basically the science of light. So the camera obscura had already been around for quite a few centuries, um, though by the 11th century, he was the first person to really be able to explain how it worked. So his contribution was creating some sort of a screen between the aperture, which is a hole, and then um, the surface. So instead of having something that would shine on an entire wall, he would basically contain it onto a plane. So, and that's a, a precursor to the way modern cameras work where you have a small screen sensor and that's where the light hits and that's like the image that you see. Although in reality, the image plane is much larger. It's a larger circle than that. So, okay. So also his contributions for science um, was, weren't only about um, optics, he also was a philosopher and he um, was also closely associated with like the, the idea of anatomy and figuring out how our eyes work. And something I think that's really interesting about him as a character is that he um, was actually in prison for 11 years. He was tasked um, by the king to dam the the Nile to prevent flooding. And this king was known as the Mad King. And because of that, he decided that he would pretend to be mad because there was possibly no way of being able to dam the Nile at all with the technology that had available. So understanding that he pretended to go mad, was in prison for 11 years, and this is when he wrote all this great work of science. And he's actually considered the first scientist ever because of that. So, and... Okay, so what is Camera for the Commons? So Camera for the Commons is a way of, uh, I guess, performing social practice. And social practice is a discipline in art that's uh, closely related to performance art. Although the difference here is that instead of an artist having their own vision and creating everything, um, the artist sort of ends their own idea of an authorship and other people are involved in the creation of the art piece. So the artist maybe comes up with a concept or what have you, and then they facilitate other people making an experience. So social practice is also another way of saying socially engaged arts. And the writer Pablo Higuera defines it as defines it in his education for socially engaged art or socially engaged art as dependent on the involvement of other besides instigator of the work. So for Camera for the Commons, my role as an artist is to facilitate the creation of the public installation in such a way that decisions that go into determining the design and the placement of the artwork is executed in a collaborative way. Here's an image of the Riverside Rocket, which you all might be familiar with. So this project has been interesting, um, mostly because of the current pandemic. Um, the The way the plan was, was to have three different workshops that led people into learning about how to make a camera obscura, from there into making smaller sculptures that could eventually be scaled up, and then from there installing these large scale camera obscuras where people could go inside of and sit and watch a scene pass by. Um, because the pandemic that's changed and I haven't been able to necessarily meet with people in person, um, this is one of the few opportunities that I had and this is um, basically my crew for Camera for the Commons. 
Um, so our designer, Carlos, is on the right. Um, we have a volunteer, Eric, in the middle. And then Dale, who's our uh, media person, is on the left. And we all made the cameras together and documented the process so that you'll be able to make one also yourself at home. So in an attempt to adapt to the project, um, I was going to debut a first camera obscura during Riverfest and that was canceled because of the pandemic. So I had to pivot and adapt to the current situation and figure out a way to bring this project to everybody. So this was a social media campaign um, with instructions on how to build your own camera what materials that you needed, and then uh, some further steps as to how to document this. So if anybody's interested in looking at this later, um, I will give you the email address. Um, you can contact me, or you can check out the website, Camera for Commons, and you'll see the instructions on how to make your own. And the third step here, you'll see exactly how it works. And I included an image that I really like of the Tom Otterness. So how do we get there? So in engaging the public, the initial step was to teach others how to make this. And from there, once they had their cameras, we were, the task is to go and look at different locations in your community that you find interesting. And that can be interesting because maybe your parents were married there or you had a first date there or it was or some sort of, maybe you graduated there or whatever sort of significance that it has to you. Um, so here we have a, an image of the, Wich, of the Wichita flag and then one of our volunteers holding a camera. So part of this um, search for different locations uh, is now more contained to social media. So our ask is for you to go out into public, take photos, share them with the hashtag, and from there we can find a location where possibly we can install a camera. And sort of the point behind this is to um, make the value of representation important. Um, there, there are a lot of places in town that maybe don't get attention as much as they should, and this is a way to uh, empower people to, uh, through photography, to choose places that they find interesting, and to let Camera for the Commons and whoever else know that it's important and it needs to be highlighted or commemorated in some way. Okay, so this is a prompt that helps us decide uh, where it goes. And this is an image of a mock-up that I made of the uh, historical building downtown and the following images are places that I uh, either find significant or I think are interesting looking. So I really appreciate this sort of brutalist building at Central and Waco. Um, you might be familiar with a spice merchant. This is in the Nobar neighborhood and this is also the Kansas Historical Society again. And these are images taken by Veronica Miranda of the North End in Wichita, Kansas. So you'll see nor uh, North High School and a mural, and then the horizontal mural on the far right, which is on a huge green elevator. So after identifying these points of interest or social significance to the identity of a neighborhood, the process moves into the design phase. So what does the camera obscura look like? And what are meaningful designs that are connected with other people in the neighborhood and communicate an idea or a feeling. And I know that maybe sounds difficult or, or kind of a vague question to answer, but the way to answer these questions is by making these objects together. So part of this collaborative effort and making these small sculptures out of paper and cardboard is from there to choose um, maybe what sort of significant objects might be in the place already that you could make a sculpture out of. So this is a, an image of a smaller model and then what the image looks like through the camera itself. So this is the, the section where we scale up. So we've made, uh, ideally we've made a model that the group has decided on and we're turning it into a full scale uh, camera that functions. 
This one is made out of cardboard. Um, I made it uh, over a span of one night with uh, Dale Small, my partner, um, uh, with Camera for the Commons. And it's mostly made out of cardboard. We have a lens that helps uh, increase the light coming through the pinhole camera. And that shines an image on the back here. And it's temporary and it's mobile. And at this point of the process, um, I'm really striving towards having something that can be moved around from place to place that different people can experience. And that uh, would be sort of a proof of concept so that uh, eventually, either when pandemic ends or if I switch completely online and start doing everything over Zoom, um, we'll be able to uh, construct those based on the designs that people make if we're not able to get together as uh, you know, a community and make those ourselves. And what I really like about this project, honestly, is that it can be made out of pretty much any materials. So this is a repurposed shipping container. Um, this is a project from a group in the Northeast that is aiming to create photographs with their camera obscura. So the shipping container, you'll see that it looks very much like a Polaroid, but it has an aperture on one end and then a built-in dark room. So they take large sheets of uh, photo paper expose it like a regular camera and then develop it. Um, so I think that's pretty fascinating that people are making these large cameras also. Um, what I would like to do eventually is to increase the scale and make something that is a lot more permanent. So this is at the Salt Lake City Community College. Um, this is also a camera obscura. So there is a lens on the far left side that's hidden from view. And inside there is a disc shape that catches the light and that is uh, what the image shows. And you'll notice that the base is pretty small and it's actually to allow for standing room only. So there uh, usually allows about three people to sit there and watch an image pass by. So ideally for me, I would like to eventually have a camera of this sort in the north side and have it aimed at the Nomar Theater or something else out there that's dictated by the community. And as for the shape, that could practically be anything. Here's a, a project that I found very interesting by Romain Alari and Antone Levy. Um, so the Camera Obscura project, making them inside of a room is not necessarily a new concept. There's an artist named Abelardo Morello who also does something very similar. So this is uh, an example of what an interior might look like if there is a pinhole camera installed in the window. And you can see here that it can be something very simple, cardboard, a small hole. It doesn't even necessarily have to be a lens to magnify the image. And from there, you can see the scene passing by during the day. So um, I think it's important to talk about what the commons means and why I've called it Camera for the Commons. So the goal of this project is to create an immersive art experience that requires the participation, but also gives agency to the people that are living in those neighborhoods. This is the difference between public sculpture and public sculpture that uh, falls under the idea of social practice as a category of art. So oftentimes public artworks are decided by a committee or by, or by a board without equal influence or direction from the public. So the camera for the commons design and location process is a way to create a sense of ownership over the execution of the project. So the commons refers to the cultural or natural resources that are accessible to members of society, including natural materials such as air, water, or habitable air, uh, or habitable earth. These resources are held in common and not owned privately. So the, the point of this is to create a camera that isn't held privately also, that is dictated by the communities that they're installed in, and also uh, bring people together into this intimate experience of looking uh, at an image passing inside of a camera obscura. Uh, and not only that, but to activate a space so that it becomes a, a hub for a community. So, uh, and if you're familiar with Nomar, you have the theater there, and also catty corner to that is the Nomar marketplace. And there are often, uh, community celebrations there or uh, or even just actual food markets or um, taco fest or the North End Urban Arts Fest is something else that occurred in that location. So to me that seems like a significant um, meeting site for the people of the North End currently. And if you're interested in getting involved in this project, uh, my website is cameraforthecommons.com. The social media is camera for commons. 
Uh, Facebook is cameraforthecommons.com. Uh, and my contact is cameraforcommons at Gmail. And I'd like to share a prompt with you all today, um, if you could. Um, maybe make a visit to the areas around in your neighborhood, go outside, take a walk, and take some photos of just uh, places or objects or statues or whatever that you find significant. And it doesn't have to be the best picture ever. It can just be uh, a way to document locations that mean something to you and um, share it with hashtag camera for the comments. And I'm curious if with this exercise, um, you'll see that your neighbors are posting similar pictures. If uh, from there, maybe it'll be revealed that there are places in common that are significant to you. And that's uh, a way for me and uh, the other people in the project to start developing a, a workshop around those areas and eventually being able to create something that is made there. So this is an image from the Wichita Art Museum. I really actually like this one. That one turned out really well. And I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. This was made possible by the support from the Knight Foundation Fund at the Wichita Community Foundation. And uh, following this talk, starting at noon, actually went um, below time, you can come to the Wichita Art Museum. I'll have this camera set up and you can look at one of the sculptures that is in the sculpture garden. Um, please wear a mask and be mindful of social distancing. And that'll be available for you to check out. Um, also, you'll be able to take photos with it and um, talk to me in person. Now, I know there's a question and answer uh, phase here. So are there any questions of, for me? Okay. Let's see, let's open the chat box. Okay, I see a question from Maggie Gilmore. She's asking, is a, is a lens the difference between the sharper photos and the more blurry photos? Yes, so I can tell you about that. Um, originally with the camera obscura, a pinhole was made into it so that, you, so that light would pass through it and reflect onto a screen. Now, depending on the aperture or the size of the opening, you'll get a sharper image but sacrifice brightness or you could get a blurrier image and have something brighter. Um, I did this project with uh, some students at uh, Wichita State, and they all there were about 12 students, and they all made different sort of pinhole cameras at different sizes, and it was really interesting to see just how much of a difference um, a few, like, I don't know, micrometer can change what the image looks like. So. If you'd like to make one at home, I recommend using uh, a sharp needle and then sanding away the aluminum can so you have a good aperture that doesn't have any sort of burr. Um, and as for the large scale cameras, because I know that that's uh, probably what you're asking about, um, I'm actually using a lens that focuses the light and makes a, a much brighter and sharper image. So for the actual installations in public um, of these large cameras, there aren't, they're not going to be just pinhole cameras, but there'll be something uh, more like high tech than that. So a lens, um, the image will still be upside down um, and then there'll be seating to hang out and watch. Okay, I have a camera, I have a question about um, what is the difference between a pinhole camera and a camera obscura? That is a great question and I feel like I didn't cover that earlier. So uh, a pinhole camera, you can actually make photographs with. Um, so for example, a pinhole camera is a closed chamber with a hole and usually you'll open it up and put either film or positive paper or some other sort of um, light reactive material, some sort of substrate, and you'll get an image that way, but you don't get to actually see what you're what you're looking at. So it's all sort of a guessing game. With the camera obscura, it's um, it's sort of like an evolved version of that. So instead of it being completely closed off to the viewer and looking at your results later, you have a screen that you can see what's happening in real time. But the issue there is that you're not able to make an image out of it. And the one of the major things about this project that I find the most interesting is that it's not about 
making photographs at all. It's mostly about the experience of looking. So um, sitting with your loved ones and watching the scene, scene change, watching a sunset, um, just watching clouds, even the storm, like however conditions that you're, that is happening that day, you'll see pass, you know, through your eyes in front of uh, the wall that you're in of the camera obscura that you're in. So that's, so I would say the major, that would be the major difference. The camera obscura is more about looking, whereas the pinhole camera is about um, making photographs. Does anybody have any other questions or, or is using the chat box? I can ask a question okay. over here. The artist James Turrell, mm -hmm. Um, so James Sherrill is interested in, in optics and um, sort of relationships between uh, negative and positive space uh -huh. and the light. So what he he's doing something similar where he's creating these optical illusions. And because of the way of the way our eyes work, um, they're constantly adjusting to the ambient light and the light around us. So. So for example, I, I don't remember the name of one of his works, but there's like a disc in the ceiling and you see the, the light change and sometimes you see clouds, but mostly it's like tonal shifts of color and light. Um, so it's, it's related, but it's not necessarily the same, but it still involves sitting and looking at something, but this time it's uh, more abstract and not representative. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, uh, anyone else? Okay, all right, that is it. Thank you every so much, everyone so much for showing up and watching. Thank you, Hugo. Let's do a round of applause um, in your homes and here. Um, it was wonderful to have Hugo share his project that he's been working on. Um, thank you, Hugo, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, and thank you for those of you that have been watching. Um, I do want to announce that we have a new exhibition opening this Friday. It is Foot in the Door. We're very excited about it. It will be on view from October 10th to March 21st, 2021. There is more information on our website. Uh, go to wichitaartmuseum.org to learn more about this great community participation exhibition. Um, we're excited to open it up on Friday. Um, thank you all, and we hope to see you soon at WAM.